Hi, my name is Jared, and this is Horror Obsession. Today, I am going to be ranking the Friday the 13th franchise from worst to best, and in preparation for this video, I rewatched the entire series from start to finish, a mind-numbing 12 movies. The Friday franchise best personifies the slasher genre, in my opinion, considering virtually every movie includes every slasher trope in spades. The rest of the Mount Rushmore of slashers, Nightmare, Halloween, and TCM, are are typically missing one or more of the classic slasher tropes, and also suffer from taking themselves too seriously at times. After having watched the entire franchise front to back for the third time, I can confidently say only one or two of these movies takes itself seriously in any capacity. The end result is an easy to digest, light, enjoyable slasher that makes an hour and a half fly by while keeping you entertained. For most of us, that is exactly what we are trying to get from a movie in the first place. And the Friday franchise delivers again and again in this respect. The movies are a bit homogenous and end up being distinguished from each other by a couple key traits, so I plan to introduce the movies using the trait that makes the movie unique for me. For example, number 12, Jason X, aka Jason in Space. Batting leadoff as the worst movie in the franchise is clearly Jason X. The movie has a budget of about 13 million, which seems astonishing at first since it looks as cheap as a sci-fi original movie, but there are a couple pretty big set pieces and a decent amount of CGI, though some of the effects look absolutely terrible. <laughs> The budget didn't go completely to waste, however, since some of the kills actually look pretty good. Notably, I am thinking about the frozen face smash, which is both inventive and pretty well done. As far as the alleged plot of this movie, essentially, Jason gets captured by the US government and they try to kill him, but apparently can't because he regenerates too quickly in what basically amounts to a slasher villain version of Wolverine. They proceed to take him up to their spaceship to try and sell him for profit, and he proceeds to eviscerate them for fun. Jason X is the cheapest looking movie in the franchise by far, and it's not like the other movies are known for their groundbreaking production quality. The acting is atrocious, and probably the worst in the franchise. Once again, stiff competition. Hey Slappy! Got a little something for you. Oh, wow. Gave her an upload. Afraid I'm gonna have to hurt you now. The plot is pretty bad, and the movie doesn't quite reach the cult classic status of something like House of the Dead, and ends up being meandering and boring. Solidly the worst movie in the franchise. Number 11. Part 5. A New Beginning aka the one without Jason. Next up, we've got the second worst movie in the franchise, A New Beginning. For some reason, slasher producers occasionally get the idea that audiences are sick of their iconic villains and want something new, and so they try and reboot the franchise with a brand new villain. Most people aren't even aware of this since the movies end up being dumpster fire disasters and are quickly forgotten by anyone with the ability to do so. Tragically, I have been cursed to never forget a shitty movie, and A New Beginning is definitely that. A New Beginning was intended to set up a trilogy of films with a different villain, but after the critical and commercial failure of the movie, they wisely brought Jason back. This movie languishes at every turn, from the sarcastic, leather jacket, wannabe Grease characters who are introduced and killed in the same scene, to the Ron Jeremy on meth guy who is introduced and killed in the same scene, to Ethel, the belligerent country bumpkin and her mentally handicapped son whose function is to stand behind her and hype up everything she says. You tell him off! <laughs> Almost nothing in this movie works, except a couple cool kills, notably the garden shears to the eyes and the flare to the mouth, but two quality kills isn't even close to enough to save this movie, and the end result is the second worst movie in the franchise. Number 10. Part 8. Jason Takes Manhattan, aka Jason Takes the Helm. This is like the third or fourth movie in the franchise that has Jason get resurrected by lightning, in a trope that starts out as lazy but gets kind of fascinating the more it happens. Jason takes Takes the Helm is not the worst movie in the franchise. 
but it suffers from a massive bait and switch with the audience. The title of this movie implies he is going to be slashing his way through Manhattan for most of the movie, sort of like how in Predator 2 they move from the jungle to LA. The premise is intriguing and could have been fun, but instead they end up spending almost all of the movie on a boat on their way to Manhattan. The movie itself is actually alright, with some cool characters like the guitar punk rock chick or these girls railing lines of coke off a mirror on their school graduation trip in what ended up being excellent foreshadowing for the 90s in general. I think my favorite part of this movie is the portrayal of New York, however, which like most movies around this time depicted it as a decaying shithole. Contrasted perfectly with the voiceover, I love this city, while also showing this guy be like, bitch fuck your wallet. There is some weird directing and editing choices which end up being distracting, like having the final girl have no reaction at all to her mother's death after she blows up in a car, or when Jason turns back into a child after having New York City sewage wash over him. Huh, I guess the fountain of youth was New York sewer poop all along. Should have just called it Poo York. <laughs> Number 9. Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, aka The Creighton Duke One. Jason Goes to Hell starts out with Jason getting blown up after getting lured into the woods by a SWAT team. This is at least a unique start to one of these movies, a welcome change after watching the entire series back to back to back. They end up using a ton of handheld shots for this movie, which is nauseating and ends up feeling like the movie was shot by your annoying uncle who just bought their first camera. Bees, guinea rats, I've even seen some guinea spiders out there! Randy, will you stop doing that? Look, I, I think we need to find a way out under the city. Some elements devolve into more of a body horror movie than a Jason movie, and the body snatcher element doesn't end up working very well for me. What does save the movie, however, is Creighton Duke, the bounty hunter who seems to know everything. I think his character was originally written as a lazy means of exposition delivery, but Stephen Williams' performance elevates the character to perhaps the most memorable in the entire series. He is charismatic, confident, and wouldn't feel out of place in a spy thriller. He does feel out of place in this series, but in a good way, and ends up rescuing a movie which is otherwise extremely bland and tasteless. Number 8. Friday the 13th Part 3, aka The Barn One. Part 3 is a funny movie in this franchise because it is the last one where they shamelessly copied everything about the original. The first movie was an attempt to replicate the success of Halloween, and the Weinsteins have even said as much, and the second movie is basically a higher budget remake of the first. Part 3 takes the premise and keeps running with it, apparently taking place the next day after Part 2. I will say, conceptually, I like this idea. I've always liked sequels which take place immediately after the previous movie, which ends up creating a more epic feel, like how Lord of the Rings is basically one enormous movie split into three pieces. Having this one start right after part two works really well, though the rest of the movie is basically the same except with inferior characters. What really sets this movie apart, however, is the fact that almost every character meets their untimely demise by going into the barn to look for somebody. The punk kids get the barn party started by getting killed in there one by one, and then the two stoner kids, and then the annoying prank kid. Which might not sound like a lot, but is six characters all wandering into the barn to look for someone and dying. Watching this movie is like watching Lemmings walking off a cliff over and over again, which is honestly pretty funny. The fact this is the movie where Jason gets his iconic hockey mask certainly earns it bonus points, somewhat mitigated by the fact they have obnoxious 3D effects throughout the movie. Part 3 is a very middle-of-the-road movie propped up mostly by its association with Part 2 and the 5th worst in the franchise, but also the 8th best. Number 7, Friday the 13th 2009, aka the Michael Bay one. A lot of people really like this movie, and I honestly cannot figure out why. I will give credit where credit is due. The intro of this movie is pretty awesome. It is intense, suspenseful, definitely campy but in a fun way, and has some jokes which land pretty well. If the entire movie was like the intro, this movie would probably be the best in the entire franchise. As it stands, after the intro, everything goes downhill. The characters are abrasive, annoying, cringy, and completely unrelatable to the point of undermining everything else in the movie. 
The kills aren't great, with a couple cool ones mixed in with some boring, bland ones. The lighting at the end of the movie is terrible, and you can't see what's going on. There is some fun stuff, though, and the production quality is pretty good. Some of the shots of Jason are actually cinematic, something missing from a lot of these movies, but the end result is a movie which is exactly what you would expect except with characters you don't like. The intro props this movie up dramatically, and without it, 2009 would be much, much lower on my list. I find this movie exhausting, and every time I watch it, I can't wait for it to end. I mean, there is a guy who talks to his fuck doll about how he lost his virginity to her and how she's as hot as ever, which you can throw in with Michael Bay's weird inclusion of the Romeo and Juliet law explanation in Transformers Age of Extinction as being suspiciously specific. Overall, Friday 2009 is about as average of a Friday movie as you can make on a modern budget, landing it squarely in the middle of the list. Number 6, Friday the 13th Part 1, aka Kill Her Mommy. The Friday franchise is unique in that almost nobody argues for the original movie being the best in the franchise. There are some awesome kills in the movie, no doubt, thanks to the always wonderful Tom Savini, including the iconic Kevin Bacon arrow through the neck kill. But other than the kills, there isn't much to this movie. There are some POV shots of the killer, a harbinger, a final girl, disappearing bodies, and a ton of investigative strange noise scenes, all of which have become slasher staples over the years. See my slasher school videos for an explanation of what these tropes mean and why they are used. It is hard to hold the present of these tropes against this movie, and though it did copy most of them from Halloween, they had not been established as such prominent aspects of the genre yet. The acting in part one is okay, certainly nothing special, but the characters end up being reasonably charming. The movie is very efficient, and of course it gets a lot of bonus points for being the first in the franchise, but also loses some points since Jason isn't really in this one either. Overall, a good movie, but definitely not a masterpiece, hence the inclusion at the halfway mark of the list. Number 5. Freddy vs. Jason, aka the one with Freddy. Obviously, you could include this movie in either the Nightmare or the Friday franchises, but I wanted to evaluate every movie with Jason Voorhees in it, so here we are. Freddy vs. Jason is not a perfect movie, but I think it accomplishes what it set out to accomplish perfectly. The plot to this movie is surprisingly robust, since it is actually not that easy to have a world with both Freddy and Jason in it, and an explanation for why they are killing unsuspecting teens, and to have them fight each other. The writers actually nail it, from having the kids who know about Freddy being quarantined in the state psych hospital, which at first annoyed me since there is no way they would keep kids locked up in a psych unit indefinitely for having nightmares, but we find out the dad of the final girl is doing it illegally, so alright then. Freddy needs the kids to remember him, as their fear of him gives him more power, so he recruits Jason to come kill kids in a way only a supernatural slasher villain could, which causes the kids to start to remember Freddy, which in turn gives him the power to come back and start slashing again. They pit Freddy against Jason as a sort of turf war, since they both want to kill all the kids in this poor town, which is kind of hilarious in and of itself. The characters are actually pretty decent, with the two psych hospital guys being funny and empathetic. Most of the rest of the cast is basically just meat for the Jason Freddy grinder, but that's to be expected. The ginger snaps girl is decent, and the stoner dude has one of my favorite moments in the entire franchise, where he's possessed by Freddy and stands there menacingly to inject Jason with tranquilizers to send him to Freddy's dream world. The cornfield party death scene is equal parts brutal and campy, the exact ratio a fun slasher movie should be going for. Overall, this movie is a joy to watch and has more creativity than I was expecting. Number 4, Part 6, Jason Lives, aka the one with the kids camp. Jason Lives is known primarily for two things. It's the last movie where Tommy Jarvis is the protagonist, and reversing the disastrous decision of Part 5 to remove Jason from the franchise. The title of the movie says it all, and Jason is back for more slashings. The movie also shows Jason being resurrected by lightning, a campy inclusion which gets copied by a bunch of the entries moving forward. The characters are pretty fun in this one, and Jennifer Cook really shines as Megan Garris giving an enchanting performance which really carries the film. There is a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor, including the old man looking straight at the camera to make a joke about audiences liking slasher movies, or this kid morbidly accepting his death. So, what were you gonna be when you grew up?
The inclusion of kids at the summer camp at all is excellent, since myself, and I assume everyone else who watched this movie in theaters, wondered whether they were about to see Jason murder like 40 little kids. Thankfully, he does not, but the threat of him doing so adds a level of tension which is missing from the other entries. The rest of the victims are generally unlikable douchebags, so their deaths are no big loss, and having sarcastic, funny kids be the potential victims in this movie really makes it stand apart, which along with the excellent, fun, intelligent, and playful final girl makes this movie the fourth best in the franchise. Number 3. Part 7, The New Blood, aka Carrie vs. Jason. I really like this movie. Paramount Pictures had wanted to create a crossover movie between Friday the 13th Nightmare on Elm Street, but after several failed concepts, the idea was scrapped until 2003, when the movie we talked about earlier came out. Instead of having Jason battle Freddy, screenwriter Daryl Hanny suggested Jason vs. Carrie. <laughs> But not Carrie, because that's copyrighted, so just a teenage girl with psychokinetic powers, and voila, part 7 was born. The movie follows Tina Shepard, who witnesses her alcoholic father physically abusing her mother and ends up accidentally killing him with telekinesis. Her psychiatrist brings her back to the location of the accident as a sort of psychodrama, but really he is trying to get her to manifest her powers for his own kind of vague personal gain. The characters in New Blood are very memorable, from the weird writer, to the stoner, to the bitchy lady in her Hillary Clinton outfit, to the nerdy glasses girl, to Tina and Don't Call Me Carrie Shepard, who apparently also has visions of the future. The writers apparently couldn't figure out exactly what superpowers PTSD gives you, so they end up kind of all over the place. This movie also includes the iconic sleeping bag scene, along with characters skinny dipping which has become a staple of the franchise. They light the nighttime shots with big ass floodlights so you can actually see what is going on, Something I actually appreciate. Nobody cares that it's a little bit unrealistic, and it's not like we have Roger Deakins available, so just go for it so we can see what's going on. The Tina vs. Jason stuff is actually pretty awesome, and Tina is a good enough character you find yourself rooting for her. A difficult task seven movies into a franchise focused almost entirely on Jason and his murderous exploits. New Blood is a great movie with an original premise and interesting characters and lands itself solidly at number three. Number two, part four, the final chapter, aka the one with Corey Feldman. Final Chapter is considered by many to be the best movie in the franchise, and it is definitely very good. Jason has his mask through the whole movie, Corey Feldman is excellent as Tommy Jarvis, Crispin Glover brings much needed humor to his role as weird dancing dead fuck guy. It says... It says you're a dead fuck. What? A dead fuck? There is the shameless introduction of the sex appeal twins to add to the body count and supercharge the horny sexual energy. And there is even an adorable golden retriever named Gordon. There isn't much to not like in this movie, as they brought Tom Savini back to do the effects, which are excellent, and help elevate the movie above most of the other entries in the franchise. Tommy outwits Jason at the end and uses his knowledge of Jason's history with his mother to his advantage, another common climax for these films, but it works really well in this movie. The final chapter came out before the franchise devolved into a farcical parody of itself. <laughs> and takes itself seriously enough to be suspenseful at times, but also keeps the light-hearted tone required to make these slashers work. The final chapter is an excellent Friday the 13th movie and highlights all of the best traits of the franchise as a whole, and ends up being an almost perfect Friday movie. Number 1. Friday the 13th Part 2, aka the one with Ginny. Part 2 is not a common choice for best movie in the franchise, so allow me to defend my decision. Part 2 takes the premise of Part 1 and runs it back, except they bring in a new killer by the name of Jason Voorhees. This decision in and of itself should elevate the movie very high on this list, since without this stroke of genius, the rest of these movies wouldn't even exist. Jason doesn't have his iconic hockey mask yet, but the result actually works pretty well. 
Jason is more realistic, still a human person living out in the woods killing people. He turns into an unstoppable zombie later in the franchise, which is fun in its own campy way, but this is the first and possibly last movie in the franchise to actually be scary. Ginny is an excellent final girl, so good in fact they wanted to build a franchise around her, but Amy Steele wouldn't return for part 3, so they had to go in a different direction. She is extremely likable in this, and the writers make way for her character to shine by killing off Alice, the final girl from part 1, another ambitious decision which ends up helping define the Friday franchise. These movies are about the killer, Jason, and not really about the victims. Part 2 is pretty understated relative to the rest of the franchise, but does a good job of isolating the cast in fairly realistic ways and then offing them. Probably my favorite slasher movie setup. I enjoy Ginny as the final girl, but also really like the return of Crazy Ralph as the Harbinger. Vicky is great, Ted is great, Sandra is great. Honestly, the whole cast of this movie is great. This is a quintessential slasher film whose risky decisions ended up putting the franchise on the inexorable path of becoming the most prolific slasher franchise of all time, and for that, it has always been my favorite Friday the 13th movie.